Welcome to part two in my talk on the Smagorinsky turbulence model. In the previous talk, we looked at the setup and the derivation for the Smagorinsky turbulence model. And in this talk, what we're going to do is extend those ideas to look at some of the deficiencies of the original Smagorinsky turbulence model. In particular, we're going to be looking at how the model behaves close to the wall and some of the deficiencies that the model has. This is a really important talk because it helps to motivate some of the more advanced large eddy simulation subgrid models like the wall adapting local eddy model, wall model LES and Van Dries damping functions. So if you use any of these more advanced LES models or perhaps you use an LES RANS hybrid model, this talk is going to be really essential for you to watch because you're going to gain a lot of understanding for how these models actually behave close to the wall and what they should be doing. So if this is the right talk for you, go ahead and get your notebook because there are a few derivations in this talk as well that you might want to follow along with. Right, here we go. So I'm going to start the talk off by just reviewing the original Smagorinsky model and looking at what happens close to the wall in this model. And then once I've done that and I've reviewed the original model, we're going to look at what methods we can use to improve the behavior of the original model near the wall and then finally, I'm going to look specifically at the Van Driest damping function and how we can use that technique to improve the behavior of the original Smagorinsky model near the wall. So starting off with the original model, it's always worth bearing in mind that the 1963 or original Smagorinsky model was developed for homogeneous isotropic turbulence far away from walls. So the idea was can we develop a large eddy simulation model that can simulate a box of isotropic turbulence far away from the wall? And so the model was actually never developed with walls in mind. And of course, this presents a problem for our modern CFD codes because the majority of analyses that we look at, whether that be uh, aerofoils or internal flow geometry, geometry through pipes and things, we always have to consider walls and what happens to the turbulence close to walls. So because the model wasn't developed with walls in mind, there are obviously going to be some problems there. And that's what we're going to look at today. So what we need to do to understand what happens with the original model is first we need to think of, with the physics, what actually happens close to the wall in a real turbulent flow. And the simple conceptual model I want you to think of is that close to the wall in a turbulent flow, of course, there's a region of laminar flow very close to the wall uh, where the turbulence is damped. And this region is often called the viscous sublayer. And people often quantify it by saying that this is the region where Y plus is less than five. In this region, the flow is laminar, the turbulence is damped. And so for us, when we think of the Smagorinsky model, we need to think of this as a region very close to the wall where there is no turbulence or turbulence equals zero. That's a way we can think of it. And what we're going to start by thinking about is, can the original Smagorinsky model calculate this region correctly? Is it able to predict a region close to the wall where the turbulence is zero? And Further, if we actually think a bit more in detail about the Smagorinsky model and what actually happens, if we recall that in the model we have our, our mesh and our grid, and smaller than the mesh size, there are a range of eddies that exist in reality, but for the Smagorinsky model, it doesn't resolve these eddies, and these are the, the subgrid eddies, the eddies that exist smaller than the grid size. And as we get closer to the wall, of course, when we're in that viscous sublayer very close to the wall, there are no eddies. All of the eddies are damped out by the action of viscosity. And so what that means is that if all of the eddies are damped, then we also expect the subgrid eddies to be damped as well. So there should be no subgrid eddies uh, in the very thin viscous sublayer very close to the wall. But also, of course, this isn't uh, an abrupt switch. In the viscous sublayer, there'll be no subgrid eddies. But then as we move further away from the wall into the buffer regions and the logarithmic regions, we expect some damping of the eddies, but not complete damping of the eddies. And then as we go further and further away from the wall, we expect the subgrid eddies to exist as they would do in the full Smagorinsky model. So this is the behavior that we expect the Smagorinsky model to have. And we're going to look in a bit more detail about does the model actually able to reproduce this behavior close to the wall and as we approach the wall. 
And the other thing to recall from the original Smagorinsky model is that the model doesn't actually uh, represent these subgrid eddies directly. What it does is it models the effect of the subgrid eddies on the resolved eddies. And the way it does this is by saying, well, we have some subgrid eddies that aren't resolved by the mesh, and the effect of these eddies on the resolved eddies is to apply a, a stress or a force on the resolved eddies, which causes the eddies, which are just larger than the grid size, to break down. And remember from the previous video we did that this is the effect of the subgrid eddies, which is mimicking the energy cascade at that cutoff point at the mesh size. And so if we have unresolved or subgrid eddies in the mesh, they're modeled as a subgrid stress. So in the CFD code, where there are subgrid eddies, there should be a subgrid stress. That's the way you should think of it. And by extension of this thought, if there are no subgrid eddies, and when the subgrid eddies are damped, we also expect the effect of those eddies to be damped, or the subgrid stress should be zero or very small. So just extending those thoughts uh, back to our little grid model that we had, very close to the wall in that uh, laminar or viscous sublayer, very close to the wall, the subgrid eddies are damped, and that means the effect of those eddies on the larger eddies should also disappear. And that means that our subgrid stress term, or tau SGS as I've called it in the slide, that should be very small or zero in the uh, viscous sublayer very close to the wall. Of course, as we move away from the wall into the buffer region and the logarithmic region, we expect that subgrid stress to smoothly transition into the value that occurs far away from the wall in the original Smagorinsky model. So before we can interrogate this any further, what we need to do is to actually return to the calculation of the subgrid stress. And what we're going to do is return to the calculation, look at it and see, is the subgrid stress tending to zero or is it being damped or is it very small as we approach the wall? Because that's the physical behavior that we should expect from our turbulent flow. And just as a reminder, the subgrid stress is calculated with an eddy viscosity approach, which I've been through in previous videos. And mathematically, that takes the form of equation one, which you can see there. And as a reminder, you've got uh, SIJ, and that's the deviatoric part of the strain rate tensor. It's not just the strain rate tensor. And if you go back to my previous video on eddy viscosity models, you can see a full derivation of this deviatoric part, what it means and why it's needed. Um, just a small side note on this on this slide, uh, in large eddy simulation models like the Smagorinsky model, we use an eddy viscosity approach like equation one, but often the second term in equation one is neglected. That two over three rho k term with the turbulent kinetic energy, that's often uh, neglected by moving that term uh, and combining it with the resolved pressure to form a modified pressure. I'm not really going to go into any detail on that, but it's worth noting that some people, when you see it written down, will have a shorter version of equation one where they have tau SGS is equal to just the first term, so two new um, and then density and the deviatoric part of the strain rate tensor. That's just a small side note. But for now, all we need to think about when we're assessing the behavior of the Smagorinsky model close to the wall is that equation one is used to calculate that subgrid stress term, tau SGS. And remember what we're doing now is we want to interrogate, does that subgrid stress term tend to zero as we approach the wall in the original Smagorinsky model? And so to do that, what we're gonna do is just look at the equation in a bit more detail and think about it. And what I want you to do now is think about that laminar or viscous sublayer very close to the wall in turbulent flow. And as a reminder, because the flow is laminar here and the effect of turbulence is uh, negligible, then the mean velocity profile is going to be linear between the wall and the edge of that uh, viscous sublayer, which may look something like you can see on the slide. And because the velocity profile is linear, we can calculate the velocity gradient, um, which you'll see on the slide there, u over h. And we can also calculate the deviatoric part of the strain rate tensor, which you can see there in equation three, the, the matrix there. And what you'll notice that even for this, uh, for this uh, 2D flow, where we've got flow moving parallel to the wall in very simple coordinates, we can see that the deviatoric part of the strain rate tensor is non-zero. And that's because, of course, we have a linear velocity profile, and therefore the velocity gradient is a constant, which is not zero. 
So if we return back to that eddy viscosity model for the subgrid stress, you can see there in equation four, we've got the abbreviated version. Then if you look at the terms on the right hand side, we know that the deviatoric part of the strain rate tensor, that's SIJ, that's going to be non-zero in that region close to the wall because we've got a laminar flow with a linear profile and the gradient is non-zero. So what does that mean? Well, equation four tells us that the subgrid stress, tau SGS, will not be equal to zero unless the subgrid kinematic viscosity, that's new SGS, is equal to zero. So when we're looking at the Smagorinsky model, what we need to be asking ourselves is, what is that subgrid kinematic viscosity and does it tend to zero in the region very close to the wall? So let's just remind ourselves of what is the subgrid kinematic viscosity and how is it calculated? It's usually calculated with equation five, which you can see there. And once again, I've got a full derivation of how the terms in that equation are derived and that's in the previous video, part one of the Smagorinsky model. So go back and have a rewatch of that if you need a reminder. But broadly speaking, remember the subgrid kinematic viscosity is calculated as the product of a velocity scale and we've got a, and we've got a length scale there. And what can we, what can we uh, deduce from this equation, from equation five? Well, on the right hand side, we've got the velocity scale and remember that the strain rate tensor that we just calculated is non-zero because the velocity, velocity profile is linear, the velocity gradient is constant, and so we know that the strain rate in that very uh, thin laminar region close to the wall is not equal to zero. And so now if we look at the other term on the right hand side, we've got the, the length scale there. And a reminder of what these terms are, we've got CS, which is the Smagorinsky coefficient, and we've got delta, which is a representation of the cell size in our CFD mesh. And recall that for our CFD mesh, of course, the cell size is not equal to zero. The cells all have a finite size. So we know that delta uh, is greater than zero. And in the original Smagorinsky model, the coefficient, that's CS, is taken as a constant and is the same everywhere throughout the CFD domain. And it often takes a value of around 0.17 or lower depending on your CFD code. But the important point is, is that that Smagorinsky coefficient is a constant and all of the terms on the right hand side of equation five are not equal to zero. And what this tells us is that the subgrid kinematic viscosity, new SGS, is not equal to zero in that viscous sublayer close to the wall. And what does that tell us? Well, we now know that the kinematic viscosity is not equal to zero. We know that the strain rate is not equal to zero. And that means that we're going to have a subgrid stress in the very uh, thin region close to the wall, which is not equal to zero, it has a, has a finite value. So what does this mean? Well, if we think about it, remember the subgrid stress represents the effect of those subgrid eddies on the resolved eddies in the mesh. And so, if the subgrid stress is not equal to zero, that means that the original Smagorinsky model thinks that there are subgrid eddies present in the viscous sublayer close to the wall. And the way I often think about it is with the simplified diagram, which you can see there on the slide. You can see in that blue region, that viscous laminar region very close to the wall, the original Smagorinsky model thinks that there are subgrid eddies there, even though those eddies shouldn't exist in reality. So clearly there's a deficiency in the original Smagorinsky model and we need to make some kind of modification to the model so that we can uh, achieve the behavior that you see in the diagram on the right of that slide. We need to uh, remove those eddies or remove the effect of those subgrid eddies and then have some gradual damping of those eddies as we move away from the wall. So now at this point we've, we've properly motivated what are the deficiencies with the original, what are one of the deficiency in the original Smagorinsky model close to the wall. And what we're gonna look at now is what different options are there available for us to modify and correct the model to achieve better behavior when we're close to the wall. And the key point I want you to take away from this talk is that there is a deficiency in the Smagorinsky model, but there are different options available for how you might correct and modify its behavior near the wall. And so when you load up your CFD code and you're selecting the 
subgrid model that you're using for your large eddy simulation, one of the things which you're implicitly doing is selecting a method which can account for this deficiency in the original Smagorinsky model. And for us to understand these different options, the easiest thing for us to do is to return to that equation for the subgrid kinematic viscosity new SGS and then look at the different terms and we can help understand what the different uh, models and methods are doing to correct the Smagorinsky model. And what we could do is, of course, we want the new SGS term to tend to zero as we approach the wall. And what we could do with this is we could either, we could use a completely different equation, a completely different model based on subgrid uh, kinetic energy, for example. We could change the entire model. Or alternatively, we could look at modifying the length scale. As we get closer to the wall, we could have the length scale of the model eddies going to zero. Or we could even modify the velocity scale as we go to the wall so that it's not just based on the strain rate. And these are some different options that we have available. But the important thing to remember is that all of the options attempt to achieve the same thing, which is to reduce the subgrid kinematic viscosity as you approach the wall, which in turn will reduce the subgrid stress close to the wall, which mimics the effects of the eddies being damped. So in this talk, I've chosen to focus on Van Driest damping, which is one of a range of different possible options we could look at. And the reason I've chosen to look at uh, the Van Driest damping in this talk is that it's the simplest modification and it's the easiest to understand. So it will support your understanding of later models. And I may choose to look at some of those uh, other options for correcting the Smagorinsky model in later talks. So in order to understand Van Dries damping, we're just going to have to look a bit closer at the physics of what happens to those eddies as we approach the wall. And what we notice from various observations and experiments, we notice that as we approach the wall, the eddies tend to get smaller. And why does this happen? Well, if we recall from basic fluid mechanics, we have two conditions at the wall. So at the point where the fluid contacts the wall, we have two conditions to satisfy or two boundary conditions. We have the no penetration condition, which means that the fluid can't physically pass into the wall. And we also have the no slip condition in the viscous flow, which means that right at the wall, the fluid physically sticks to the wall and the, the tangential velocity or the velocity parallel with the wall is zero at the wall. And these two boundary conditions apply to the mean flow field and the mean velocity profiles, but also to the eddies as well. And based on this observation, we're gonna uh, develop some understanding of what happens to eddies close to the wall and use this uh, to correct the Smagorinsky model. So what we can do now is think physically about what happens to eddies close to the wall. And the picture I've got for you on the slide there shows some eddies with a range of sizes uh, with centers at some distance away from the wall. And what you can see is that the, the larger eddies are physically blocked by the presence of the wall. And the reason for that, of course, is that the flow can't pass into the wall or run parallel with the wall right at the wall. And so what this does is it actually limits the size of the eddies. So if you think you're some distance away from the wall, an eddy couldn't physically exist that was larger than the distance uh, that the eddy exists from the wall. So we're getting some limiting of the eddy size by the physical blocking presence or the inviscid blocking provided by the wall. And it's not just the larger eddies which are physically limited by the distance to the wall. We think the eddies also move around when they're closer to the wall as well. And as an eddy moves around and it moves closer to the wall, this eddy is also going to be blocked by the presence of the wall as well. And so just by deduction, we can see that eddies which are smaller than the distance to the wall, their size is also going to be limited by the distance to the wall. So what we've seen so far is that there's going to be some kind of uh, blocking mechanism for all of the eddies as we approach the wall. And this has a net effect of reducing the eddy size close to the wall. And of course, as we get to that uh, viscous or laminar layer very close to the wall, the action of viscosity is going to be strong enough to completely damp out those eddies. And that's why the eddies completely disappear. But for correcting the Smagorinsky model, we can see that what we need to do is we don't just need to understand why the eddies uh, are damped, we also need to quantify the size. So we know that the eddy size in some way is going to be reducing as we approach the wall and that size we can think of as tending to zero as we reach the viscous sublayer. But what 
how can we quantify that? Could we derive some kind of a function or a data fit that would tell us how the eddy size reduces close to the wall? Because then we could use that to correct the Smagorinsky model. Well, it turns out we can do that. We can quantify the reduction in the eddy size as we approach the wall. And the way that we do this is we borrow from, uh, we use a RANS framework to assess this. And the reason we're gonna use RANS here, even though we're talking in the context of large eddy simulation, is that we can actually solve the RANS equations close to the wall by hand, and that allows us to derive a mathematical function to show how the eddies reduce close to the wall. And for this derivation, if you want to see the derivation in full, you can uh, refer to Stephen Pope's book called Turbulent Flows, which I'll link in the description to this video, and the derivation is on page 289 if you want to see it in full. But what I'm going to present here is just a, an abbreviated version so that you can understand what's going on. And what we're going to do is start with the eddy viscosity equation that you're probably used to by now from RANS, which is there in equation 6. And we've got the turbulent Reynolds stress on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side we've got the, uh, the kinematic viscosity uh, nu t and then the velocity gradient of the mean velocity profile. And just quickly to signpost that this uh, turbulent kinematic viscosity is due to all of the eddies this time, because remember we're, we're using a RANS approach just for this uh, hand derivation, and the du by dy is the mean velocity profile. So just some small flags before we start there. But this is the equation we're going to use, and we're going to use it to quantify the eddy size as we approach the wall. And we've, we started with our eddy viscosity uh, equation, which we sometimes call the Boussinesque approximation for RANS. And how are we going to use this equation to derive a length scale as we approach the wall? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use some information, some empirical data that we know for how those profiles vary as we go close to the wall. And one of the profiles which you may be familiar with is that in the logarithmic region, uh, normal to the wall, the mean velocity profile uh, obeys the equation which you can see there in the red box. And you'll probably be quite familiar with this equation by now. And so you can see this equation is going to be useful to us because we can use it to evaluate that mean velocity gradient du by dy. And this is what we're going to do with the uh, with the eddy viscosity equation. We're going to slowly fill in the terms with information that we know and then rearrange it to derive an equation for the length scale as we approach the wall. And so du by dy, the way we would do that is work out du plus by dy plus, which I've got for you there in equation seven. And then we can use a substitution of variables in the chain rule to derive du by dy in equation seven, which you can see there. And you may want to follow along and work out the mathematics by hand if you want to follow this, but it's not essential. So we've got du by dy. The other thing we can uh, state is the Reynolds stress or the left left hand side of the eddy viscosity equation. And what we can do is we can use the observation that in the logarithmic region, the Reynolds shear stress is relatively constant. And you can see this if you uh, look at some of the plots in uh, Stephen Pope's book or any other source on turbulence, you'll see that the, the Reynolds shear stress is relatively constant uh, in the logarithmic region. And it balances the wall shear stress because the, uh, the, laminar, um, the laminar shear stress in this region is very small. And so that allows us to write equation eight, which you can see there. We're substituting the Reynolds shear stress there for rho uh, u tau squared, which is the friction velocity. And so we've now managed to, just by observation, we've managed to fill in two parts of the eddy viscosity equation, equation nine there. We've got the left-hand side and we've got the velocity gradient on the right-hand side. Substitute those in and then rearrange, and that allows us to reach equation 11, which you can see there at the bottom of the page. Now, what can we do with equation 11? Well, the key uh, point of deduction that we're going to use here is that if you remember from previous talks that a kinematic viscosity can be written as the product of some length scale and some velocity scale. And we used this previously to uh, derive the equation for the uh, Smagorinsky, Smagorinsky model in the previous talk. We're going to use the same idea here to derive an equation for the length scale as we approach the wall. So if we recall that a kinematic viscosity in general can be written as the product of a length scale and the velocity scale, and you can check this by checking the units if you want to, what we're gonna do is 
for our velocity scale, we're going to use the square root of the Reynolds shear stress, those fluctuating velocity components. We can use the square root of that for our velocity scale. And when we do this, the length scale is the mixing length. So this is the, the key point in the derivation here. And so if we combine equation 12 with equation 13, and we use the square root of those uh, velocity fluctuations there for the velocity scale, this allows us to arrive at equation 14. And we can see now that we've got a length scale has appeared in our equation, that's the L sub M. And what we're gonna do is rearrange and solve for this length scale. And we can do that uh, by recalling once again that the uh, that Reynolds shear stress is relatively constant and it balances the wall shear stress. And that allows us to simplify down to equation 18, which is an equation for the mixing length. And don't worry if you're not sure about what the mixing length is, because I'm gonna go into a bit more detail on what the mixing length is in a few slides, so you're gonna understand. But for now, all we need to know is that the mixing length is one possible measurement of how large the eddies are. So fantastic, we've now derived a mathematical equation for the size of the eddies as we approach the wall. But what does the equation mean? Is it sufficient? Does it contain all the information that we need for our Smagorinsky model? Let's have a think about it. So if we look, we've got a fairly simple equation. We've got the mixing length is equal to kappa times y. And y is the distance normal to the wall. And kappa is an empirical constant, which takes the value of around 0.4. And so what does the equation tell us? Well, it tells us straight away that as we reduce y, as we move closer to the wall, then the mixing length, which is one, one metric that describes how large the eddies are, the mixing length gets smaller. And so this is telling us that in some way, the size of our eddies is reducing as we approach the wall. And even though we derive this for the logarithmic region, we could look at that equation and see that clearly as y tends to zero, the mixing length will tend to zero. So this will tell us that our eddy size in some way should be tending to zero as we approach the wall. So we've made fantastic progress here, but in order to make more progress, we need to think in a bit more detail about what does the mixing length actually mean? And then this will allow us to combine it together with our Smagorinsky model to correct it close to the wall. In order to understand the mixing length, what I've done is I've put together a small diagram for you here on the slide. And what I want you to do now is to think in terms of a parcel of fluid that's gonna be transported through your turbulent flow. And I've got the parcel of fluid there, which is highlighted in blue. And you could think of this parcel of fluid as maybe a, maybe a parcel of dye tracer or a physical substance that you released into the flow. And if you release that parcel of fluid into the flow, what you find is that the fluid parcel is moved around and is transported by the large eddies and the mean velocity profile. So you can see there in the diagram where I've got the, a large eddy shown in gray, the fluid parcel will tend to be moved by that large eddy and the mean velocity gradient, and will then be dissipated and broken up by the smaller eddies. And this is one way you can think about uh, fluid particle transport in a, in a turbulent flow. And so what will happen as that, parcel, as that parcel of fluid moves is that it will eventually be dissipated and the mixing length is the distance traveled by that fluid parcel before it's dissipated by the smaller eddies. And you can see how this relates to the other length scales on the diagram there. Clearly the mixing length is not the same as the integral length scale or the representative size of all the larger eddies shown in red. The mixing length is, is smaller than that, but also the mixing length is somewhat larger than the subgrid length scale as well. And that has, that has some interesting implications for us. So, because that fluid parcel is being transported by the large eddies and it's being continuously uh, sort of broken down by the small eddies, what we can deduce is that the mixing length is always going to be larger than the subgrid length scale because the parcel is physically being transported by the larger eddies. And so this allows us to make the key observation of the talk which is the subgrid length scale, that's the, the length scale associated with those small eddies that are smaller than the grid size, it can't be larger than the mixing length. The mixing length has got to be larger than the subgrid length scale. And this allows us to draw the link between the model and the equation which we just derived for the mixing length to our Smagorinsky model, which relates to the subgrid length scale. And just a quick reminder of the Smagorinsky model and the subgrid length scale, how it's defined 
is recall that in the original Smagorinsky model, the subgrid length scale was just taken as a fraction of the cell size. So if you think of you've got all of your cells in your domain, and then the subgrid eddies are, are assumed to be a fraction of that cell size. So within the cell, the representative length of all of the subgrid eddies is a fraction of that cell size. And the, the fraction is given by CS, which is the Smagorinsky coefficient. And of course, that fraction uh, is less than one and usually takes a value of around somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2. And what we can now do is bring all of the information together that we've, that we've looked through in the talk. We know most importantly that the subgrid length scale can't be larger than the mixing length and that allows us to write equation 20 down. You can see on the left hand side you've got the subgrid length scale and that's going to be the minimum, so whichever is smaller, of the mixing length and the, uh, the fraction of the cell size which is given in the Smagorinsky model. And the reason that we use this minimum, of course, is that as we're approaching the wall, the mixing length is reducing, because we saw that in our previous equation, the mixing length is reducing, and the Smagorinsky model for the subgrid length scale is staying the same, because everywhere we're assuming with a, a constant Smagorinsky coefficient that those subgrid eddies take the same fraction of the cell size. And so as we get closer and closer to the wall, eventually the mixing length uh, will be smaller than, that, than the Smagorinsky model computed value. And because we know that the subgrid length scale can't be larger than the mixing length, we can write equation 20. And what we can, of course, do is substitute in our equation for the mixing length, Lm, and that allows us to arrive at equation 21. And this is fantastic. We've made some significant progress towards improving the behavior of the Smagorinsky model so that as we approach the wall and we get into that logarithmic region, the subgrid length scale is going to be reducing because it can't be larger than the mixing length. But some of you may have noticed, of course, that the model is not complete at this stage because we've accounted for the logarithmic region, but what about the viscous sublayer and the buffer layer that are beneath the logarithmic region? Or if we think that to our classic velocity profile normal to the wall, what about this region very close to the wall where y plus is say less than 10 and reduces as we approach the wall? What are we gonna to do to our subgrid length scale in this region? And ideally, of course, what we want from this is we want a model that's gonna be continuous all the way through from the wall, through the viscous sublayer, the buffer layer, and out into the logarithmic region. So what we'd like to do now is motivate how we can use the same framework of stuff that we've done so far, but put together a complete continuous model that's going to be smooth all the way through. Well, it turns out there is a smooth continuous solution, and this solution was proposed by Van Driest in 1956. And I don't want to go through the full mathematics in this talk because naturally the, uh, the derivation and solution is quite a bit longer, but for those of you who are interested, the full mathematics of the derivation can be found uh, in Stephen Pope's book on page 304. So go ahead and look that up if you're interested. But broadly speaking, what uh, Van Dries did is he derived a velocity profile that fits the experimental data. So the experimental data is given by the black circles there, and the velocity profile is given by the integral, which you can see there on the slide. And it's quite a complicated integral. There are quite a few terms in there, but on the bottom you'll see you've got the mixing length, Lm. And Van Dries showed that this velocity profile, this integral velocity profile, gives a very good agreement to the experimental measurements all the way through uh, the wall profile if we use the form of the equation shown in the red dashed box there. So you can see you've got the mixing length is equal to kappa y and then multiplied by some kind of exponential function which you can see there and you've got y plus which is the distance to the wall and you've got a coefficient a plus in there. So these mathematics at this stage look quite complicated and we don't really need to know how they're derived. But the interesting point is, is that in that equation for the length scale, which you can see there, there's a coefficient a plus. And if we use a value of 26 for a plus, it turns out this value of the coefficient gives a good fit for the velocity profile all the way through from the wall to the logarithmic region. So that's really the key takeaway from this point. And what I want you to do is to focus in now a bit more on this Van Driest solution onto the mixing length equation, which you can see there in equation 22. 
If you look at the first term there on the right hand side, you can see we've got kappa y. And this was our solution in the logarithmic region that we derived before. And then after that, we've got uh, some kind of exponential function, which is presumably going to be uh, blending our behavior somewhere together. And so what we could do straight away is rather than use the form of equation 22, we could write the mixing length as we've seen it in equation 23 there. We can write the mixing length is equal to kappa y, which is our logarithmic solution multiplied by d. And d is often referred to as the van Driest damping function. And that's what I want to look at a bit in a bit more detail in the next slide to help you understand. So what happens if we plot this function d? Uh, if you just open up your favorite uh, uh, processor and calculate the functional form of d and plot it on a graph, what you'll see is that, of course, d has a maximum value of 1 and then a minimum value of 0. And you can see that very close to the wall where y plus is small, d tends to 0. And then as we move further away from the wall and we move towards, say, a y plus of 100, we can see that d tends towards 1. And so what does that tell us? Well, if we're multiplying this damping function d by, the, by kappa y, that tells us that far away from the wall in the logarithmic region, d is just going to equal to 1. And so we, we uh, retain that logarithmic solution that we derived previously. We've got kappa y. But then very close to the wall, d is going to tend to 0, and that allows the mixing length to tend to 0 very close to the wall. And it's going to tend to 0 faster than if we just had the kappa y linear equation that we had before. And so what you can see here is that because d tends towards 1 in the logarithmic region and then it tends towards 0 close to the wall, you can think of d as a function that accounts for the viscous effect close to the wall. And this is very important because conceptually the model is smooth and continuous. We've got this mixing length that varies smoothly from 0, very close to the wall, and then up to kappa y in the logarithmic region. It's smooth all the way. But the function d we can think of as accounting for those viscous effects that start to become really strong uh, in the viscous sublayer. And again, the other important point to take away is that that value a plus, which you'll often see, is just the coefficient that's calibrated to give good agreement with experimental data. And if we were to change a plus, that would, of course, change the shape and the curvature of that d function. But it would still tend to zero close to the wall and tend to one far away from the wall. So we've now got all the pieces. We can now put everything together for a complete model that corrects the subgrid length scale as we approach the wall in the Smagorinsky model. Now, we're going to use the same, uh, the same uh, point of reasoning as we did before for the subgrid length scale, which is that the subgrid length scale can't be larger than the mixing length. That's the key point which allows us to write equation 24 down. But what we're going to do now is we're going to use the different equation for the mixing length rather than kappa y, which we used before. So if we substitute in the van Driest solution for the mixing length into equation 24, that allows us to arrive at equation 25 here. And this form is often called the, the van Driest uh, damping solution or the van Driest length scale. It's often referred to by different names in CFD manuals. Um, and so what I'd recommend you do is that for your CFD code, have a quick look in the manual if you're using a van Driest solution and see how does your CFD code formulate the equation because often it's expressed or written slightly differently. But the key point from this talk is the way that the model is formulated and the reasoning behind it. You can see that we've started with the Smagorinsky model, which has a, an assumption that the subgrid length scale is constant everywhere. And then what we've done is we've used the idea of the mixing length to reduce that subgrid length scale as we approach the wall. And then the van Driest solution allows us to reduce the mixing length even further as we approach the wall because it accounts for the viscous effects, which are going to result in, the, in that length scale dropping off even faster than if we didn't account for it. So we've been through quite a lot in this talk. I just want to wrap up and summarize the key points from the talk overall to help you conceptualize what we've talked about. As a reminder, in a turbulent flow, we have eddies of a range of sizes, and the eddies are damped near the wall by a combination of inviscid blocking and viscous damping. 
and in a large eddy simulation in general, the subgrid stress should be damped near the wall because the subgrid stress represents the effect of those subgrid eddies on the resolved uh, eddies. And so if there are no subgrid eddies, the subgrid stress should be zero or very small. And the key point is that in the 1963 original Smagorinsky model, the subgrid stress is not damped close to the wall. And there are a variety of different methods that can be used to correct this behavior close to the wall. And when you select your subgrid model for large eddy simulation in your CFD code, this is one of the things that you're implicitly doing is you're choosing the method uh, of correcting that Smagorinsky model close to the wall. And one of these options that you can use for correcting the Smagorinsky model is to use a Van Driest uh, damping function to reduce the subgrid length scale close to the wall. So that brings me to the end of the talk. By now, you can probably see that we're starting to build the key foundations of our understanding of large eddy simulation and the subgrid models that are used. And we're gradually stepping towards some of those more uh, advanced models that you may use in your real day-to-day -day simulations uh, for large eddy simulation. Uh, so at this stage, I'd really like to hear from you. What models do you like to use in your everyday uh, simulations and what subgrid models would be particularly useful to you if I made a talk on them? Because of course there are a variety of different paths I could go down and models that I could look at. So it'd be really helpful if you just let me know which models would be most useful to you because then that can help me to choose where to direct my talks in future. Uh, and as always, if you, if you like the talk, let me know in the comment section below and I look forward to hearing from you.